Good morning. morning. Need it louder. Good morning. morning. It's finally getting to be warm. I'm so excited. (laughs) And I'm excited to be here this morning to be a part of this series on your nail. Uh, It's it has become for me a very uh, pointed, poignant (laughs) series for me. Um, I hope you have your nail with you this morning, and if you have brought it, please get it out and have it in your hand. If you have forgotten yours, if it's if it's ripped a hole in your pocket and lost its its way this week, you can ask uh, hail one of the ushers maybe and ask them to give you another one. I'd like for you, if you have it, just to hold that nail in your hand as we study God's word together this morning. You've been connecting with your nail, I hope, over the the past week through the Lenten study as well, and uh, we've been talking about different aspects of a nail this week. And I love, one of the things that I love in particular about the study is how short the entries are, because they're these little bites, these little nuggets, these images that are short enough, you can work it in as part of your morning routine or your evening routine, but they're just these little images they'll carry with you throughout the day. And the images and the, the aspects of the nail that we've talk, been talking about this week are, it's sharp. It may have come as, as a surprise to some folks. We've, we've chosen a sharp nail. It's sometimes inconveniently sharp. You, you may have had it in your pocket. You stick your hand in your pocket and you prick yourself on it. You might bleed a little bit. It might rip a hole in your pocket. You might have things tumble out. You might lose something. A nail might even derail you from the path that you intended to take. A few weeks ago, Joy's sitting right there, and she knows the story intimately because she is my Sunday school leader. A few weeks ago, my family and I, we were on our, it was a cold morning that morning, (laughs) and we were on our way to church. I was so proud that we had gotten my three-year-old and my three-month-old all dressed in the car, ready to go. Cold morning, get in the car. And we got down the road, and then we heard that, familiar sound and we had realized that the night beforehand a nail not one of these nails it was a few weeks ago but a nail had popped our tire had let all the nail uh, all the air out of that tire and there we were on the side of the road with this flat tire we did not make it I'm joy I'm so sorry again for that warning that we didn't make it (laughs) but God sent a good Samaritan to help us change that tire and I know that it was God who sent that person to help my husband change the tire because if it had been me we would have been in marital distress stress. <laughs> but God sent this good Samaritan to help us with, with our children in the back, and I was very grateful for that. But a nail might just pop your tire and make you change your course. And that's, of course, the point. Aha, the point of the nail. <laughs> a nail that changed the course of history. A nail that changed everything. God took the negative consequences of a nail and he turned them into the greatest good that the world has ever known through Jesus the Christ. Our verses for the day come from the book of Romans. We've already sung and prayed through some of them. We're going to read through and focus on Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. You can read along with me. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now many of us are familiar with this first part of this first verse, he works all things for good, but you might be surprised to learn how that that part of the verse, it takes on new meaning when we look at that verse within the context of the chapter that surrounds it. Romans 8 tells a story, and that story, it hinges on this verse 28. It's like a literary hinge. It's called the fulcrum. You you talk about a fulcrum in in physics, and you can imagine the fulcrum of a seesaw. It's the tipping point. It's also a literary term, the fulcrum. It's the turning point of a poem. It's also the turning point of a story, that tipping point the place where the story turns. And often in storytelling, that tipping point, that fulcrum, it happens when you move from a comfortable place into some kind of disruption, a rip in your pocket, some sharp and inconvenient point that pierces you. And Paul begins this story in this chapter in a very safe place. He addresses his audience as children of God. And what a comfortable, safe place that is. A few nights ago, I was coming back from my small group. My small group's leader leader's also over there. I was coming back from my small group, and it was later in the evening. My son had fallen asleep in the back seat. 
And if any of you have done this, if you remember back with your children, they've fallen asleep in the car and he was, he was gone. And so I came back in the back and I, I picked him up. He's three, so he's getting heavier. I picked him up and he rested that head right in here. And I carried him on upstairs and set him down into bed. Oh, oh, to be a child and rest our sleepy weight into the arms of a parent. That's how the Father lovingly cares for us. And this chapter is addressed to specific children, the children of God. And this is an important point as Paul leads us to verse 828. We're all children, but we're not all children of God. When we call on Jesus to be Lord of our lives, we become children of God, as Paul writes, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And this role of child of God, it's crucial when we confront those times when we're cut or we're inconvenienced by a nail. Because Paul is about to plunge us into a very uncomfortable place. Times when we groan. And we groan in our weakness and in our sufferings. And in the midst of these times, he writes, we know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And my first introduction to this verse was through a friend. It was several years ago. An evening several years ago, I got word that this friend had been in a skiing accident and it was bad. She had broken her leg. And it had taken them several hours to get her from the side of the mountain where she had fallen over to a place where they could get her any kind of pain medication. But in all of that time, as she was lying on the side of that mountain, as she was in, in the ambulance headed towards the hospital, as they took her on the gurney in to get x-rays, she kept saying this one thing over and over again, all things work for good for those who love the Lord. All things work for good for those who love the Lord. She claimed the power of that verse in the midst of pain and in the midst of suffering. And I don't believe that God wants us to suffer. I don't think he wants us to be in pain. But in a fallen world of pain, in a world of sharp points that can cut us, like the point of your nail, he can use all things for his good purposes. He can take the tricks of the devil and he can turn them into something that not only glorifies himself but makes us stronger. And there's an important distinction here. Because this sermon is on what good is a nail. Well, what, what exactly does Paul mean by good? That's, there's a way that Romans 8.28 can seem a little bit trite. Because anybody with a positive attitude can take a bunch of lemons and turn it into lemonade. <laughs> yeah, I had it bad for a little while, but, but look, see, look all the good that's come up. See, I'm in a good place. Paul isn't talking about making lemonade. He's not talking about bucking up. Paul is talking about when believers enter into a time of trial and we ask the Holy Spirit to intervene and for God to act. When we ask him to use our nail for his good. And this verse would be trite to the point of insulting were it not for the second part of that verse. All things work for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. When we love the Lord, we know what it means to love the Lord when we believe in Jesus, that he took our sins and he nailed them to a cross and we're free. We are free. For those who are free, who are called for his purposes, he can work kingdom good through all things. And this is important because I can't tell you that my friend was ever the same after that accident. I can't tell you that her leg ever felt the same. I can't tell you that she ran as as fast as she did before that accident. Physical recovery wasn't necessarily the good that God was working. He was working on kingdom good. And she knew that. She didn't waste that moment, that nail-pierced moment. She let God use it. Because when she claimed that verse, when she, when she verbalized it, her suffering, her nail, it became a witness. And that story of her faith and that moment of darkness, it worked outward in our community and it impacted people so that in all things, in all things, they would glorify the Lord. And I have to think that it was the Holy Spirit's intercession that helped her to find that verse, all things work for good in that moment of pain. The Spirit, as this chapter in Romans says, that very Spirit that intercedes with sighs too deep for words. I have a second story for you. I have a very dear friend, and she and her husband have just adopted their first child, and I will not share with you their full story this morning, because I am inadequate to express the depth of their struggles and their journey to hold their baby girl in their arms. 
and I respect them too much to try to put their testimony into my own words. I can say that she is a woman of the greatest faith. And her spiritual strength through their adoptive journey has been a testament to many people in her community. And there were many times when my friend's desire to have children was pierced by sharp, inconvenient realities. But there were moments as they were being pierced over those years of trying to bear children and over the years of waiting for a birth mother to choose them. In that long, faith-filled journey, there were very human moments of doubt there was a time when my friend and I, we were on a retreat. It was in the woods. We were, it was a beautiful fall day. It was, we were out in the woods, sunlight streaming through the leaves, and my friend was in tears. They had been waiting several years for a birth mother to choose them, and she said, I just don't know if it's in God's plans for us to have a child at all. And I have to be okay with that. And these pains, these piercing pains... These were birth pains. Because a few months later, they took home their baby girl from the hospital. And that beautiful child who now loves to smile and to dance, and you hum a tune for her, and she'll start doing this. She'll start wiggling that little bottom. She dances this beautiful, dancing, smiling baby girl was on the other side of those birth pains. And when she goes to bed at night, as her parents carry her into her crib and set her sleepy weight down in that bed. She passes underneath a sign, a wooden sign over the lintel of her door that says, for this child we prayed. Romans 8, 28, this is, sorry, 8, 18 through 26. These are selections. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is about to be revealed to us. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. God took a situation that was pierced by pain, both for the adoptive parents and for the birth mother. And he worked it for such kingdom good. And these parents, they did not waste their opportunity with their nail to let God work good. For this child we prayed. What a witness. <laughs> Third story. When I was nine years old, I was aware that my father was an alcoholic. And I was aware that I couldn't bring my friends home to visit me at, at my home because he was abusive. And I know that that man loved me as much as he could love anyone, but the effects of his choices left my mother with broken vertebra in her neck, and it left me with many emotional scars that only the healing hand of the Lord, working through many other loving family members and friends, could heal. And I look back at that child, that child who saw her mother, her mother physically broken in order to protect her from abuse, that child who ran with her mother across a field one night to escape. I look at that child and I look at what I know of the love of God and I know that God did not want that pain for her. He groaned and he sighed with that child and with her mother in the presence of that nail. And today, over 20 years later, I know that he doesn't want the pain that my mother still lives with in her neck. But he used that pain, that piercing pain, for his glory. Because as some of you may know, I am a stubborn woman. You can ask my long-suffering husband, I am a stubborn woman. <laughs> and God used my mother as a living witness to show me the depths of Christ's love. And my mother, who loves the Lord, who is free, who loves the Lord, who was called according to his purpose. My mother showed me Christ's sacrificial love powerfully as she sheltered me from the violence that surrounded my childhood. And God used her as a witness to instill in me a faith in Christ that is unshakable. As we prayed earlier, no, in all things, we are more than conquerors 
For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when my mother looks at me, she still sees that child. And I know many of you can relate. You see your grown children, and, and you can still picture them as they were when they were tiny. And last week, we sit up in the balcony. I'm usually bouncing my, my little three-month-old. In fact, you all can see me up there. Y'all can't. <laughs> you can see me in the back. Last week, as Mickey gave the sermon, I was up there sitting in the balcony, and I was holding our baby girl with one hand, and I was holding my nail in the other. I got it out, and I had this knee-jerk reaction to get that thing away from her as, as far as possible that I could because it's sharp. And then I realized, that's the Father's love. That's our Father's love. Because he didn't just see his grown son on the cross. He saw his baby. His baby. With nails through his tiny wrists and little feet. God used those nails for kingdom good. And Jesus didn't want that pain. He had that human moment, Father, let this cup pass from me, but thy will be done. Jesus allowed God, he gave those nails to God. Jesus allowed God to use those nails so that nothing, not anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God. And the chapter in Romans, chapter 8, it ends with these good words. But it also begins with them. It begins with that same message at the very start, 8-1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for we are free from the law of sin and death. We find the happy ending at the beginning of the story. We find, we find this story, freedom. Freedom! Big brave heart, freedom! We find it at the beginning of the story from the very start. And sometimes it helps to hear from the very start that everything's going to turn out okay. <laughs> Especially when that story involves sharp pointy obstacles. And this is what I do with my three-year-old when he gets scared in the middle of a story. I give him the ending of the story in the middle. It's okay, it's okay. Nemo will find his father in the end. It's okay. <laughs> he needs to hear at, some, at a certain point in some stories that it will all turn out okay because the story is just too scary. And at various points, we all need reminding from the beginning that God will make this okay if you fall on a mountain. <laughs> that nail that suddenly sticks into you. <laughs> or if you've been struggling with doubt, a nail that slowly digs deeper into you. Or if your struggle was years ago and you're still living in the aftermath, a nail that scars. Beloved, he will use your nail. He works all things for good. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that your love intercedes in a world to not only sigh with us, but to save us. Lord, help us each to see this morning. What good is my nail? Lord, I love you, and I know that you predestined me to be conformed into the image of your Son. How are you calling me to use my nail for kingdom good? Pray that you would go with us as we exit today into this warmer weather filled with your Spirit and filled with your love. Help us to carry our nails this week and remind us of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to carry your nail throughout this week and to continue to use that Lenten study. Again, they're, they're just wonderful images, short little bites to carry you through the day as a way to connect with your nail. And if you love the Lord, but you've never prayed to become one of his children, if you've never prayed for that spirit to, to fill you, I'd invite you to come up here and someone during the, the closing song or following the service, someone will be here to pray with you, to talk with you, pray with you if you feel led. We all get pierced. We all need help to make our nails count for his good. Will you please sing with us our closing hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father.